Hi, I'm Hoodie Hair, and this is the story of how I abandoned my dreams of goblin conquest and built myself a castle to hunker down in instead. My original goal was the conquest of one of the areas of the world that had become overrun with goblins. In total, there were three areas I identified. The Southwestern Plains Goblins, the Southern Forest Goblins, and the Northwestern Hills Goblins. Given the choice, I settled for the Northwestern Hills, where humans, goblins, elves, and dwarves had all settled to form an angry hodgepodge of people. Because my goal was for my fortress to be my main base of operations for an all-out goblin war, not a showroom of modern dwarf design, I wasn't too concerned with the aesthetics of it, and so I just set up the basic workshops, stockpiles, and dining room in the hollowed-out veins of ore that we mined when we first burrowed into the ground. With the basics in place, I then assembled my first squad. Oni's Militia, which was named for its captain Oni. At this point, we had very few dwarves and resources, and lots of things to do, so Oni and her squad could only train part time, and had to spend the rest of the time helping the other dwarves do things like build dormitories and produce iron weapons and armor. Eventually, we had built up enough of a population that a second squad could be put together, this one named Eru's Militia, after its captain Eru. As both squads trained, they were given a little opportunity to test out their combat skills when one of my dwarves went berserk and thought that attacking the people with the shields and swords was the best move. It definitely wasn't. He was my first dwarf to die, and as is tradition in all my forts after my first death, I realized I didn't have anywhere for the body to go. To avoid disturbing my dwarves too much, I told them to toss it in the body pile outside while I dug out some new areas that had cemetery potential. Eventually I picked a spot and placed my first gravestone where I thought it would be out of the way of the rest of the fortress. With another influx of migrants, we created a third squad, Zuli's Militia, after its brave captain Zuli, who came to our fort having already killed an elf in her past life. Our increased population also meant that it was now election time, and our first mayor was elected. With that came the responsibility of setting up proper mayoral accommodations. This area that had been mined out for its ore seemed like a nice little spot, and so I tidied it up and then set up bedrooms, offices, and a dining room around the edges, so that I would not only have the mayor's rooms, but also bedrooms for each of my prized militia captains, and offices for my manager and bookkeeper. The whole arrangement seemed great, with a lovely common area between the rooms and everything that they could have wanted. Unfortunately, in my desire to tidy up the edges of the room, I had made quite the mistake. You see, in winter, our lovely little brook turned to ice and disappeared from view, and so while mining around, I may have accidentally opened up access to the river without knowing it. I thought that something might be wrong when I stumbled across the fact that one of my walls was an ice block, and I knew something was definitely wrong when a couple minutes later that ice block turned back into water along with the rest of the river and began to flood my base. Quickly, we went into emergency mode, and built the quickest wall we could between the main part of the base and the new section, sacrificing some iron in the process. As is apparently becoming typical of me, I trapped some of the dwarves on the wrong side of the wall. In total, after building the wall, there were three dwarves trapped on the wrong side of it. Two no-names, and Zuli the militia captain. Zuli was trapped in her bedroom, while the other two were trapped in the common area and the mayor's dining room respectively. Fortunately, dwarven carpenters are pretty good, and dwarves are watertight as long as you don't open them, and so we could easily rescue Zuli by mining through the back of the room to give her an escape. Come to think of it, we probably could have done that for this other dwarf as well, but she kept opening up the door and filling the room with water, and I didn't want to get my floors all muddy. Once the remaining trapped dwarves died and had burial slabs in the cemetery, I marked all the front doors of all the rooms forbidden and dug a perimeter around them so that I could reuse the rooms easily by putting in back doors. Based on the number of fish that were frolicking in the old common area, I'd say that it was an even trade. Two dead dwarves for some happy fish. Moving on from that whole ordeal, we ended up continuing to grow in population, which led to the creation of the fourth and final squad of the fortress, Sib's Militia, after its leader, Sib. Having four squads of dwarves spending a good chunk of their time learning to fight came in handy not long after, when a brush titan appeared in our territory. It was a towering and terrifying pterosaur, and it killed a fishery worker on its way to our entrance, but was soon swarmed and killed by my elite soldiers. Other than Zuli, she was busy making a figurine of dwarves at the time. As time passed, new people joined the fort, and the fort expanded to include a temple, a guild hall, and a hospital unfortunately positioned just a short walk through the cemetery away from the main body of the fortress. 
We briefly had a starvation scare, as I hadn't bothered to build a farm in the caverns where the soil was good, and so I had to bail my dwarves out by purchasing some meat and fish from a caravan, and sending some dwarves down to the caverns to build a more efficient farm. Eventually, after a little over four years of waiting for my dwarves to train up, I sent Oni's militia on a mission to reconquer a former dwarven settlement from some goblins. As they marched out the door, I felt pretty good about their chances, and just waited for the news of the successful takeover. And then winter turned to spring, and spring turned to summer without a hint of news. With Oni's militia seemingly not coming home, I began to think. Over the past few years in this fort, I had grown quite attached to these dwarves and this fortress, and with the prospect of sending out my squads and them not returning seeming increasingly likely, I decided to put a stop to my plans of goblin domination and instead pivot, look inwards, and defend this place I had built with these dwarves I loved in the coolest way I knew how. A castle. Now as we all know, the first step to building a castle is to spend hours mining out all the stone necessary, but while that was happening, a mountain titan quadruped made of coral came and insisted that we defend ourselves in person before we built a castle to defend ourselves. Fortunately, even a squad down, the mountain titan was no match for the highly trained biting techniques of our mace lords. After killing the mountain titan, the soldiers seemed pretty pleased with themselves, given the way they immediately went to work brainstorming names for all their gear. Eventually, as our stone stocks grew large, I decided it was time to start building. First on the to-do list was the northern tower slash entrance, which would be the highest point of the whole castle. I had learned my lesson on corners with the construction of my evil fortress two months ago, and so this time I stuck with the tried and true square. In total, the tower was five floors tall, plus a dangerous roof for falling off of. Once the tower was completed, I laid out the outline of the walls, as well as the southern caravan entrance. From there, it was mostly a lot of work laying down flooring for both the upper and lower level. On top of that, the walls and guard towers were extended vertically, each of which necessitated even more flooring for access. Multiple hours after I began, the walls and floors of the castle had been successfully erected, with the only problem being the routine interruptions by the local monkeys. They were easily dealt with, they don't make monkey-sized armor after all, but they were a thorn in my side for causing cancelled construction jobs all over the castle, slowing down an already slow process. By this point, it was the year 130, nearly eight years after we had arrived, and around four since we had sent Oni and her militia to conquer the settlement of Diamond Rasped. They still weren't back, by the way. And so I wanted to put the finishing touches on this thing, and so I spent the next three hours building the central keep slash throne room slash dining room, putting up the walls, windows, and roof, and then filling the room with furniture and statues made of platinum, engravings from the dwarves of the fort, and all of the artifacts that had been created in the last eight years. With the room decorated, it was time for the finishing touches. Two monkeys tamed and then chained in the dining room as symbols of our victory over the monkeys in the monkey wars. The only wars I ended up having any impact on at all. At the end of the day, I think I was happier seeing Eru, Zuli, and Sib training and working around the fortress and castle than off conquering goblins. If only I had realized that before sending Oni away. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.